First of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for this wonderful conference. It has been a great pleasure to be here in this wonderful country, as well as hearing so many beautiful talks. So uh, I'm happy to talk about uh, geometric obstruction to scale separations here, which is based on, uh, based on two papers and some work in progress. The papers that have appeared is one of them is on upper bounds and dimension gaps of CFDs with, with Collins, Jaffries, Chu, and Yao. And the other one is holography and the KKLT scenario with Severin Lust, uh, uh, Max Wiesner, Kai Chu, and that's, that just appeared a few weeks ago. And some work in progress with Daniel Jaffries, Miguel Montero, and Irene Valenzuela. So, uh, so what is the story about the scale separation? There are, if you ask about homogeneous solutions in quantum gravity context, and, uh, we have basically three possibilities depending on the sign and the value of the cosmological constant, Minkowski, anti de Sitter, or de Sitter. And, uh, you know, the Minkowski space, you know, we have a lot of examples in the context of quantum gravity where that's the solution. The ADS, also we have a huge number of examples using holography and so on. We have a lot of exam examples that we have under control. And then potentially there could be also maybe the Sitter space. And the question of scale separation refers to the following, that if you take a string compactification on some manifold, uh, where, this, where the manifold is given by, is this the pointer, I think so, right? Yes. Uh, so the manifold is given by k, you can choose, uh, you can ask whether or not the size of the k and the value of the cosmological constant are, are independent of each other or not. In other words, the size of the underlying space is independent of the k or not. In the Minkowski space, the underlying space is infinitely big. There's no natural scale, it's, it's infinite. So therefore, it's natural to expect that there is no particular relation to K if you can compact phi at all, and we know there are solutions. So in the context of, therefore, Minkowski space, there's no problem with scale separations. That is, you can have a compact manifold, and then you can have infinite Minkowski space, no problem. In the context of ADS and, uh, and the, the sitter, that seems to be a different question, because now, ADS and the sitter have themselves a scale given by the value or absolute value of the cosmological constant, and that determines the scale, namely the ADS scale in the context of ADS, and similarly for the sitter, having to do with the curvature of the space itself. And you can ask whether or not the size of the manifold and the size of the, or the radius of ADS or the length scale or curvature scale, which relates it to the length scale in ADS, are they related in any way or not? Now, the distance conjecture, conjecture has led to a relation between them of this type that the lengths, in the, at least in the context of ADS, they are not decoupled, that the length scale on the compact manifold and the length scale on the, on the ADS side uh, have some scaling relation like this with a coefficient A bigger than or equal to one. The, a equals to one is the strong form of the conjecture. That is the length scale of ADS and length scale of the, of the K or some parts of K. There are some examples where you know you are just a piece of K which has this scale. So that there's some part of K, some part of the internal manifold whose scales like ADS is part of the stronger version of this ADS distance conjecture. Now CFT dual for ADS gives dimensions for the would-be holographic dual uh, field theory or conformal field theory given by the mass of the states in the ball times the rate, length scale of ADS, which, which is the same as the LADS to the length scale of K, which gets related to LADS over one minus A. So A bigger than one or A equals to one or bigger than one means the length scales could be of order one, the dimensions could be of order one or smaller if A is bigger than one. But if A is less than one, if you make the length scale of ADS big, then the dimensions can be arbitrarily big and so you will get, uh, you, get a, you get potentially a big gap in your, in your theory in terms of dimension gaps for the CFT. And so the question is, if this is true, if this is possible. Now, um, if this were possible, if you can get a big gap, now uh, there are different versions of scaling you can consider. This could be potentially interesting for constructing the sitter vacuum in the sense that if you can scale up one versus the other independently, you can have a situation where your ADS value is very close to zero and your manifold is not going to smithereens or not going to huge big, it's not exploding. 
and you could have a situation where that's under control and ADS is very close to zero and you just do a little bit of supersymmetry breaking a little bit and you hope you get the sitter that way because a little bit of changing something cannot give you a dramatic change in your potentials and that you can get a sitter. So this question, therefore, of whether or not you can do this is critical for the sitter constructions, if at all. At least that's one, one approach to these kind of questions. So it is important to settle this and the reason that's that important to say this is because this is a case where we can have more to say, potentially using rigorous methods that are available to us today. So is this possible to have A's less than one in general? That is that question. Of course, if you have A less than one, it doesn't mean that's good enough for getting this iter either because still the length still grows. They are not independent. So regardless of whether or not A is less than one or not, as long as, as, long as A is not strictly... Uh, is as long as the scales are not strictly decoupled, then you, you may still have a problem doing this, 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 uh, this other version of it. But still, it's an interesting question to know whether this can be achieved or not. What do we know about dimension gaps in CFTs? Well, the dimensions of operators in dimension D CFTs less than or equal to D is what we call relevant or marginal uh, operators. Dimensions uh, delta bigger than D we call irrelevant. Uh, operators. And this is a fact that no CFT is known with no lying, with no low lying conformal operators. They all have low lying conformal operators that, and the biggest known gap is for the two dimensional case where the gap can be made as big as four. With the huge amount of examples we have in conformal field theories, this is the best we could do of the gap. This is already surprising. So, People did try to go beyond four. In fact, Witten uh, tried to say, if there was such a theory, what would it look like? And he, he conjectured the existence of these theories with bigger and bigger gaps of order C. And we don't know if these exist or not, but we do actually know due to the recent work by Dupay and collaborators that at least the majority of them don't exist. So therefore, it is a very <laughs> difficult thing to get CFTs in this property with dimension bigger than two. And this is already manifest that the gaps are difficult to do whatever you want. It's difficult. Now, uh, we can relax the condition. We may say, okay, we may not be interested in gaps, uh, complete gaps. You might have some low-lying operators, fine. But then the question is whether or not there will be a big gap after that. In other words, you can have, a, you can have like a few states here and then suddenly a big gap. Could you have a situation like this? So the delta is not like, it's like uh, very big, but the first gap is not big, but after a few of them, then you get a big gap. Could that happen? Again, none is known like that. Question is, yes? No, there are operators which get big. The question is whether there's a gap of dimension of operators. In that case, there's no gap. No, no, no. It's just that it's already obvious that it's not. I'm talking about the dimension of all operators. Dimension of some operators, not all operators. You know, I mean, in other words... Well, okay, I don't understand the comment. Anyhow, there's, there's, we are talking about the dimension of operators uh, not having a gap. You can take a subclass of them having big gaps, no problem. That's not the question here. The question is the dimension of the operators. For example, in the ADS5 times S5 example, the S5 scale is not separated from the ADS scale. And to make it more precise, I will actually make clear what I'm actually saying here. You focus on the massive spin two operators. So you talk about the scaling of the spin two operators and the objects which are in the conformal theory correspond to spin two. These correspond to the spectrum of the Laplacian, scalar Laplacian on the internal manifold, because that's what gives you the corresponding spin two in the, in the corresponding holographic dictionary. So you look at the spectrum of the Laplacian and you ask, okay, let me not look at all operators. Let me just concentrate on this subset of spin two operators. Can they at least be made big gap? Can I make a big gap with those? If I can't make a big gap with these, then there's at least an existence of operators which I cannot push arbitrarily large. So that's the question. Can we do that or not? So said, said differently, this translates to the statement, can I have a scalar operator on some internal manifold 
which is giving, describing you holographically right. dual theory, such that the spectrum of the operators, eigenvalues of the operators, is big. You have a big gap. Or said differently, since the eigenvalues of the operators correlates with the diameter of the space, could you make the diameter of the corresponding internal space arbitrarily small? That's the question. Now, if you take the ADS times K, where K is an Einstein manifold, these are uh, the, a class of a large number of examples, not all the examples, but a large number of examples which have been studied in the context of holography. So in this context, this question that we asked whether or not this can happen or not, translates to the question of the following type. Consider uh, an Einstein manifold, K, which, which satisfied the Ricci curvature being equal to metric up to a proportionality factor which we uh, fix the constant to be the dimension of the Einstein manifold minus one, as is conventional. So for the case of the sphere, n-dimensional sphere, this corresponds to curvature one, the usual curvature, in other words. And then you ask radius one, and then you can ask, in this context, what does this mean? It turns out with this normalization, then you're just asking basically the eigenvalues of these operators will be directly proportional to the, uh, related to the dimension of the operators using this formula because now you're computing the mass in the ADS scale. So you're basically normalizing the ADS scale to be, to be one here. So consider the case when the K is the sphere. Now, this one, uh, you might think that, okay, this is uh, easy to, to modify to get an Einstein, a different manifold, which is still Einstein, but it's much smaller. You, can, you, you might think that you can make this as small as you want, basically by taking a group action, a discrete group, and quotienting it out. Take an SON plus one subgroup, and there are infinitely many discrete subgroups of SON plus one. Pick your favorite infinite sequence of these and start modding out, like ZN or something else, and start doing something to try to make the radius as small as you want. Naively, one would think it's easy to do. All you have to do, the volume of whatever it was, or the radius, or volume, sorry, volume would be scaled by a factor of the order of the G because of this factor, and naive estimation of the length will give you one over the order of the G to the power of one over N. Well, this is incorrect. The naive estimation is not correct. We cannot just go by the volume and estimate the KK scale that way. And a simple example, you would convince you that's not going to be that naive about this. So if you take, for example, sphere, let me just draw the sphere more permanently here. If you take a sphere and you caution, let's say, by Zn, you can make it very, very tiny in, this, in, in, in one direction, but the north and south pole are still same diameter. And at most, the only thing you can do is an extra Z2, maybe identifying north and south, and that's it. You can stop. That didn't, that didn't cut the diameter too much, maybe by a factor of two or something. So this doesn't do the job. But you might think, well, this is not very creative. Maybe there are other high, higher dimensional cases. You can do more interesting groups and do something to get it down to small size and small diameter by some judicious choice. In fact, if you look at the first eigenvalue of the Laplacian for arbitrary group, quotienting of the sphere, you can show that this can never be made arbitrarily large. More than that you can find the first eigenvalue has a definite uh, value given only by the dimension of the space. So you've spi you fix your dimension n here, and you say, I choose an arbitrary group of SON, subgroup of SON plus one. I don't care if it pre preserves supersymmetry or not. I don't care if it is fixed points or not. You can never achieve the diameter to be too small. The diameter is always bounded below, and therefore the first eigenvalue cannot be made arbitrarily large. Okay. Now, just to give you an example, for the, just to see what, what this structure looks like, if you take it S3, for example, in the case of the S3, the, you can show that the first eigenvalue of the Laplace, the first uh, eigenvalues of the Laplacian will only be in this range. Non, uh, the first non-vanishing eigenvalue will always be in this range, 3 until 168. This translates to the dimension of the, uh, the first spin operator between 3 and 14. Now, this does not mean the gap is 3 or 14, or up to 14, because I'm only restricting to spin two operators. So indeed, in, in these examples, you can show the gap is not, you, you always have relevant de deformation. So this is, this is not testing that question, but it's at least testing that you cannot make 
the dimension of all the operators arbitrarily large, and in particular the spin two operators, cannot be made arbitrarily large. This is the relevant one for the KK modes that we talk about usually anyhow. Now the interesting thing is that you might ask, which subgroup of, 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 of the SO4 achieved this 168? And the subgroup that achieved it is not an infinite order subgroup or a large order subgroup, but actually the most exceptional one, the E8 ones. The E8 subgroups of SU2, the diagonal icosahedral group embedded into SO4, is the one which gives you the highest one. So the highest one, the biggest gap you can get is by something very exceptional. Sa rings a bell, monstrous moonshine was some, some such thing. The, ga the case you get the maximal gap in that context has something to do with the exceptional group, this monster group. Here the same, this mini version of this, when you try to get the gap big, you have to use the E8 or the icosahedral group, which gives you the would be E8 to do the best. So you cannot do any better than that. Infinite works of large N and one don't help you. The same thing with the S5 and S7, you can, you can compute these dimensions and the gaps. Always there's the diameter of the space is bounded. Uh, instead of being pi, which is the diameter of the sphere, you can reduce it, like the example I told you, but not by much. You can go from pi to 0.96 or from pi to 0.84 with arbitrary subgroups of SO8. These are non-trivial statements, so there is nothing you can do. So the sphere case, forget about it. So sphere doesn't do the job. But it's fair to say sphere is a special example. There might be more interesting ones, so we should look for other ones. Another class of examples are D3 brains probing Calabria threefolds. These lead to Sasaki-Einstein manifolds when you're trying to find the corresponding uh, holographic dual. So if you take a singularity, for example, of the Fermat type like this, you can ask the same question, which one gives you the largest gap? for the scalar operator. The scalar operator for this Sasaki-Einstein manifold is very difficult to compute explicitly. Perhaps there are numerical methods, but no explicit computation has been done. However, there's a subset of eigenvalues for which you can use symmetries of the, of the Sasaki-Einstein manifold to compute it, and these involve what's called the holomorphic eigenvalues. For those, you can actually compute the eigenvalues exactly. And if those gaps are not made arbitrarily large, then you already know the gap cannot be made at least as big as those, bigger than those. Even though there, there could be lower ones, we don't know, but at least they cannot be more than those. For all the Fermat Calabias for arbitrary A's, you can ask which one gives you the biggest gap. It is this guy. With 2, 3, 11, and 13, it gives you the biggest gap of the first spin two operators, the holomorphic operator, which in the conformal field theory dual means chiral operator in n equals to one, in the n equals to one jargon of the d equals to four, which has dimension 202. Now you might say, well, this is getting big now, right? 202, it's not, I was talking about dimensional manifold. Remember, I'm not saying that there are no lower, lower, lower lying operators lower than this. This is the first holomorphic one of spin two. That's what I'm saying. But this already shows that you cannot make in any of these Calabias, the, the, the gaps of the eigenvalues of the Calabia are arbitrarily large, no matter how creative you are. But you could say, well, before, before doing that, well, maybe I should add it. You could say, well, come on, Fermat is not creative. Go to more singular ones. Calabia sing singularities have been studied, decomposed to various types. In all the Calabia regular singularities, you can check it, you get again the same story, there's a bound. And therefore, and then there's also the irregular singularities. The irregular sing singularities have not been fully classified, but among those that have been classified, again you do, again you get a bound. So everything you do in terms of all the manifolds that we know doesn't work. You have a bound. We move on. Calabia fourfold. You decrease the amount of supersymmetry, like M2 brains, for example, probing a Calabia fourfold singularity in the context of M theory. You can ask, what about the, those dimensions of those operators? Now, if you look at the Fermat type, you can push it even further up. 2, 3, 11, and 13 were the exponents before, now become 2, 3, 7, 83, and 85. The first, the, the, the eigenvalues, again, the dimension of the operator cannot be made more than 6,975. For this example, there was conjecture by Silverstein and Polchinski that some f theory construction will give you arbitrarily large gap. This is a proof that it cannot, at least in these kind of singularities that you have. 
So therefore, these naive arguments of scaling type that people generally make in physics literature has to be taken with a big, big grain of salt. That it is not easy to get separation of scales and to be too cavalier with scales and scaling arguments could mislead us, similar to what might, I might have, one might have thought about the sphere quotients. It is not correct. It is not because of supersymmetry. You can break it, you can fix points. It doesn't help you. The diameter is bounded, and it doesn't matter if you go to fancy calabias or this and that. It doesn't help. Now, yes. Here I'm assuming, here the discussion here is I'm describing the property of each Einstein manifold. This is not the most general holographic setup by any means. So I'm not claiming I have proven this for all holographic examples. But for this class already, it doesn't exist. It could be a piece of, for example, in the usual case of string theory, like ADS3 times S3 times K3, I am talking about the S3 piece, no problem. Right. Right, correct. No, I'm talking about D-brains probing Calabia singularities. So they come from Calabia, like the Sasaki Einstein manifold, which are positively curved Einstein manifolds, are the things that you get when you bring the three brains probing singularities of Calabia. So you get the cone over that is the Calabia. The cone over the Sasaki Einstein is a Calabia threefold, singular Calabia threefold. That's how you get these in the holographic context. Yes. All of these, all of these, all, these are, these are, this is includes all of the, no, all of the known ones are gone. And some of the ones that have not been studied are gone. And all the irregular ones that has been classified are gone. The only ones that could potentially be, if there are infinite family of infinite irregular ones, that we haven't shown yet because it hasn't been classified yet. But if there are a finite number of them, then they are gone. Because we have shown in each family can be, there is a bound. So these are the rules of interpretation Yes, 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 yes. These three brains probing. So all, essentially all Calabia, so Saki Einstein, you will have the same issues then. Now, one may think this is a rather restrictive statement and applies only to the brain's probing singularities. And a notable counterexample would be DGKT. The DGKT will have, have all these different bells and whistles of various kinds of fluxes and all that, and you would think that this doesn't appear. In fact, uh, so this argument directly does not appear, does not apply to K, uh, DGKT. DGKT proposes to give a counterexample to the scale separation. There's still, there's still correlation between ADS and the length scale of the internal manifold and so forth, even in DGKT. So it doesn't violate the distance, uh, Swampton distance conjecture for ADS uh, in the weak form. It does violate the strong form. Maybe the radius of ADS is bigger. Uh, sorry, the radius, yeah, the radius of ADS can be made bigger parametrically than the radius of the internal DGKT, the claim is. And that actually, uh, we, so we don't have a direct argument to check that statement, even though DGKT leads to bizarre would be conformal theories with bizarre scaling like n to the nine halves and so on. But there is actually a direct statement which actually suggests that this may not be happening. Namely, thanks to the work by, uh, uh, by uh, Kribiori et al., they took a certain class of DGKT-like setups where you added, added and descript, added and extra some fluxes and get rid of some other fluxes so that you can actually dualize it by combination of duality, mirror symmetry, etc. So you get M theory on pure geometry, Einstein manifold. So they apply the same DGKT logic and they get scale separation just like DGKT with the same logic of DGKT. But they cannot construct the explicit metric directly. So we suspect what's happening there is that since now, our, if our conjecture is correct, that no matter what you have for Calabi-Alves, you always will have a minimal diameter that would rule out that version of DGKT. And the problem is that the naive scaling of what it should be is what's wrong. That if you do it more carefully, you get the correct scaling and you would not get any problem with the issue of scale separation. You, will get a sc non you, get, you won't get scale separation. So that's the first part of what I wanted to say. How much time do I have? Okay. So the next part, I want to talk about holographic obstruction to KKLT. So, KKLT is one of the few attempts to obtain the sitter in string theory. Now, uh, I would call it attempts because it hasn't been accomplished what it wants to do yet. And there are two steps in it. 
So the, in the KKNT scenario, the first step involves using type 2B orientifold or F theory on elliptic Calabia fourfolds. If you're doing F theory is this, and type 2B is the orientifolds of Calabia threefolds. Uh, and you, you introduce fluxes to obtain a supersymmetric ADS with small value of, uh, small value of uh, absolute value of lambda. So you want it almost lambda very, very, very close to zero. That's the first step. In this context, you have a supersymmetric construction of ADS. So that's, at least that's what the hope is. The second step is the, is the case, is the step that breaks the supersymmetry by adding anti-D3 brains at highly warped parts of geometry to uplift the energy to positive values, to lead to a sitter space. For this step to work, for this sequence to work, you really need this to be small. So the step two is harder to analyze from our perspective because it's not supersymmetric and we have less tools. But thankfully, the first step is, is looking for supersymmetric ADS vacua and with small lambda, with a Calabia which is not parametrically that large, and therefore, it sounds like the same issue I was talking about for the case of scale separation. So this is like an example, even though it's not parametric for infinite n, but a similar version, finite, finite version of that n version that I was saying, that scales are separated between Calabria and ADS. So this would be a counterexample to the spirit, at least, of the scale separation, if this were possible. So can that happen? So let me review KKLT. You start with F theory on elliptic fourfolds or Calabia three orientifolds, and in that context you get the tadpole condition, which has been reviewed already. So I would be rather brief. So the so you can the, you can have to add either the three brains or uh, or some flux involving the Nouveau Shorts or Ramon Ramon fluxes uh, of H field or, or the F three. So B Ramond or B Nouveau Shorts fluxes, uh, and you have to add them up such that it, it basically builds up the, uh, the Euler characteristic of the corresponding elliptic Calabria fourfold in F theory language divided by 24, and you can also formulate it in the language of type 2B as well. Um, in the orientifold language, you'll get some formulas like this, but anyhow, that's not my main, main emphasis here. So, you start, so, so what we want to do is that we want to start with F theory on this, and we want to do a situation where as much as, as much as tadpole is, as much as possible of the tadpole is in the fluxes, so you basically try to get rid of the number of D3 brains. Let's assume that there's a solution involving no D3 brains and just, uh, just put everything in fluxes, because this gives you a maximal uh, leeway in trying to construct ADS vacuum. So to leading order, this leads, so, sorry, this leads to the effective 4D theory, which looks like a term like this, the leading order, where the superpotential, if, uh, if you ignore the Kähler potential part, uh, or corrections to the, from the Kähler, from, from the instantons and so on, naively it just looks like the omega wedge G4, where G, in the context of a Calabria 4-4, where G4 is a combination of the Novo Short and Ramon fluxes of type 2B, which combine, unify, in this context of the M theory language or F theory language descended down one dimension to the G4 flux. And so then this omega 4 is the holomorphic 4 form of the Calabria 4 fold. So in the orientifold limit, you can reduce this, this basically becomes the same flux as this one, where you get G3. Uh, being F3 minus tau H3, so this gives you the, super, the familiar superpotential that we get from flux compactifications in this language. I will interchangeably be using the language of a Calabria fourfold and Calabria threefold sometimes. Sometimes I refer to G4, sometimes I refer to G3, but they are related by this dictionary. If we define a quantity which is uh, which is given by e to the k over two times the absolute value of w. This looks like the tension of some domain wall, because after all, w is usually a tension of something. And it turns out that the ADS vacua can be reformulated. The ADS vacua are, are, are points for which diw is zero with non-zero w. It's equivalent to solving critical points of this tension. 
So if you have a tension for the domain wall, and if you go to the critical value, you have, as long as the critical value appears at W not equal to zero, you have already gotten an ADS vacuum. This was, uh, this is actually, uh, this, this connection and the, the fact that this is useful was pointed out by Sviatik and company already a while back. And the fact that this looks like attractor equations was already pointed out by Renato Kalash after the KKLT paper, very naturally related to it, in fact, because of that study. So this equation says, ah, this sounds somewhat like attractor equations. Indeed, um, it is very similar to the attractor equations. For example, if you consider type 2b on a Calabia threefold, and you consider D3 brains wrapping three cycles, leads to the, uh, leads to the black hole uh, in 4D. This was discussed today in, in one of the talks. And the mass of the black hole is given by, uh, by you take the integral of omega, the holomorphic three form over the three cycle, with a normalized, where you have normalized the holomorphic three form, so this gives you the mass of the would-be black hole. Now, this is not the attractive value. This is just the mass of the black hole, which could change depending on which complex structure you want. If you want to get the entropy of the black hole and the mass of the corresponding black hole, you will have to go to the attractive value, which is the minimization of the critical point of this di of z exactly the same way. So, so this tension formula, the tension here, will give you exactly the, the corresponding critical point leading to the corresponding attractive value, gives you the black hole story. There is a difference, a big difference between this case and the, the fourfold case. This case does not depend on Kähler moduli at all. The Kähler moduli does not appear in this formula at all, whereas in this case it does appear. For example, even if you ignore, even if you ignore the superpotential corrections, uh, Kähler, through the, which depend on Kähler classes, it already appears in K, even though I haven't told you what, how it appears. So it's not quite decoupled from the K. So we can, in principle, consider ADS and 4D or 3DF theory on elliptic fourfold or M theory on Calabria fourfold. The statistical arguments that one uses in KKLT would apply equally well to both cases, whether you're talking about constructing ADS vacuum through M-theory compactification or type 2B on oriented folds, so on, they give you exactly the same reasoning. So there's no difference. So if we ha one has a problem getting one, then presumably this, the same one will apply to the other one. So the three cases we can say more about because it's purely geometric, and that's what I want to mainly concentrate, but the same thing can be lifted up to 4D. It's purely geometric because just M theory on a Calabria fourfold with some G flux sounds like very similar to the kind of setup we have been talking about before. So we are replacing the flux with brains uh, if we want to interpret the attractor equations. What could the attractor equations mean? You replace the flux with brains. Why? That's what holography is in all the examples we know of in the context of string theory you replace the holography fluxes with brains. That's why we should do the same thing here. Look for what would correspond to the, what would generate the fluxes for G4. Well, G4 gets, corresponds to a given cycle. If you take M5 brain wrapped around the four cycle, what do you get? Well, you get in, in three-dimensional space-time a one plus one-dimensional domain wall. Exactly co-dimension one in three. And that would be that whose tension would be related to what I just was telling you about. And you would think, therefore, that extremization of this Z will have something to do with going to the attractor value exactly like what other examples suggest. So everything seems to be ready to be applied in the context of holography in this setup where the relevant objects, oh, thank you, where the relevant object seems to be M5 brain wrapped around four cycles. Indeed, this kind of domain wall and the flow has been studied by Sviatik et al. So you, they, put a domain, they put a domain wall and you flow with these equations where the flow equations is like a, you view the Z, the, uh, the, the tension of this domain wall as a, as a, a potential and you just gradient flow will give you ADS, mm -hmm. develop the ADS uh, uh, when you, where you put the brain far away, uh, uh, far into the z direction, you'll get an ADS vacuum where the, 
where the, where the ADS emerges by the, by the fixed point of this flow. So if you have a fixed point, in other words, if you have a situation where D of Z vanishes, then this flows, you, you get to a situation where this phi stops moving, and at that value, you have reached an ADS. So this is the relation between having a brain generating a would-be ADS through its flux. So, so in the context of holography, this sounds very natural to expect that this should work. Namely, you, have, you would expect that there should be a holography if there is an ADS vacuum because lambda is very close to zero. It has, has all the conditions that you would expect to have in order to have a holographic description. And therefore, the object which gives you that flux is there in the theory. It can generate it. Therefore, it's natural to ask, what does it do if you say that is the dual, as, as is always the case in all the examples we know. For, for the step one of KKLT, this means that ADS dual is a combination of D5 and NS5 brains wrapping three cycles. In that context, if you take D5 and NS5 brains wrapped three cycles to give rise to H flux and F3 flux, they give you a two plus one dimensional domain wall in three plus one dimension. And the same picture I was drawing, uh, as was done with Svieti et al., will give you a flow to the would be ADS vacuum on the right. Now, if you have uh, the corresponding uh, ADS, we can estimate what the radius of ADS would be just using the central charge of the theory. So, for example, in the context of ADS, uh, ADS4, length squared should go like the, the number of degrees of freedom of D5 NS5 brain bound states that give you the corresponding object. And in the context of ADS3, the length of ADS3 is related to the central charge of this M5 brain. So the bigger the central charge of this uh, object which has the domain wall in it, the more degrees of freedom you have there, the bigger the ADS you're going to get. What we're going to show now is that the central charge of the D5, NS5, or M5 is bounded by the order of magnitude being a Calabria Euler characteristic. Before I do that, let me just give you three similar cases in, uh, which, are, which we know in 3D. Take ADS3 times S2 times X3, where X3 is a Calabria threefold. And this is the MSW setup, where they, what they do, again, is actually very similar to this one. They turn on the G-flux. G in that case, they are studying M5 brain, uh, wrapped around four cycles of a Calabria threefold. It gives you a G-flux. And in that context, the G-flux uh, is perfectly OK. What they will end up getting is, uh, is, a, is a, what we call the MSW string, gives you corresponding ADS3. And the AD, and, but the, the thing is that they are not parametrically separated. The X3 is separated, but, the S3, but there's an extra S2 which gets bigger and bigger. But there is a solution there. But now we want to have a similar solution in the context of would-be KKLT by, well, the KKLT is actually going to be the lower one, but let me just do both cases. There are two other ways you can do it. Take ADS3 times the Calabria fourfold again and now put, consider M5 brain on holomorphic four cycles. That gives you a set of fluxes that you can have, would be dual to the corresponding ADS3 times X4. Or you can have M5 brains, uh, sorry, this was that one. Or you can have M5 brains on special Lagrangian four cycles. There are two different situations. I call it B and C. The case that will become relevant for KKLT is the second one, it turns out that it corresponds to the special Lagrangian ones for manifolds, very much in spirit to MSW, except that MSW was doing holomorphic four cycles, and instead of holomorphic, now we are ending up with special Lagrangian. Big deal. We are just doing a similar story. It's just both we preserve supersymmetry. In the mirror symmetry story, they get exchanged, so it's very much in the same spirit, you could say, as, as MSW now. Okay, let's see how much we can push this central charge up. Just like MSW do, we can do it. So for example, for case A, you can use anomaly inflows to actually compute the central charges for the left and the right moving degrees of freedom on the string. Because we are, after all, talking about ADS3 duality. And what we end up getting is the C left and C right giving by these formulas. 
If you do the same for the case B, you get something which depends. So, so here, notice this triple intersection. The triple intersection of the four cycle ends up being the leading driver of the central charge in the left and right mover for the MSW. Similarly here, for the case of the B model, for the B example, you get C4.C4, and this is going to be the leading behavior for, the, for this geometry as well. And the reason is actually easy to understand, because if you think about it, if you, if you take n copies, let's say, of this uh, M5 brain wrapped around the same cycle, you can deform it. And if it doesn't intersect itself, you just get addition, linear, in terms of central charge. The only reason you don't get addition is because they might intersect. You get local degrees of freedom. Since the degrees of freedom locally are locally computable, does not depend on global geometries or anything, you just get some universal factor times the intersection number cubed. And so that's not surprising that the leading behavior goes like C4 cubed. Similarly, here it's not surprising that for, for, the, for the two of them, if you can deform them away from each other, the only one that's relevant is how many, how many dis distinct points you are forced to intersect. And again, it's not surprising. So similarly, now you can go back to the case of interest, which is going to be relevant for the KKLT for slack four cycles. And you find the, the story, you can compute the C left and C right in terms of degrees of freedom. And it turns out that the, the geometry of the uh, special Lagrangian inside the Calabria fourfold is fixed. If you have a local, if you have a special Lagrangian L, this local geometry is cotangent of L4. And the self-intersection is actually dictated by Euler characteristic of L4. So you learn that the Euler characteristic of the special Lagrangian is related to the self-intersection of it. On the other hand, the self-intersection cannot be too big because that self-intersection gets related by tadpole conjecture, to, not conjecture, to, by the tadpole condition to Euler characteristic of Calabria fourfold divided by 24. So you have a bound. You cannot make this big. The self-intersection of the four cycle cannot be made big. And that's the issue. So the issue is that you cannot make the self-intersection big. It's bounded by chi, and that leads to an upper bound on the ultraviolet degrees of freedom, which is a multiple of some constant times Euler characteristic of the X4. Now, you might say, so what? So be it. There's a huge number of Calabria, lithic LFT Calabria fourfolds with 10 to the 9 Euler characteristics, or 10 to the 10. That might be good enough. What's the problem? That might be the potential answer. There is a problem. That doesn't quite work that easily. The problem is, if you agree with this formula, then you have the following problem, because in both cases, this, you have the ADS scale works like this on this line the, that's bounded by chi, both of them, whether you're in 3D or 4D. But the species scale is bigger than the Euler characteristic. Why is that? Well, the Calabria cohomology gives you the number of massless modes. Therefore, the effective coupling, effective, plank, effective cutoff is not Planck anymore, it's lowered. And so the effective cutoff is not the Planck length, but bigger. And the species scale, which is that length scale, scales like chi, or L squared scale, scales like chi in, in the 4D case. So in both 3D and 4D, we end up, regardless of what chi you choose, you're talking about the Planck in Calabria, and the effective field theory breaks down. Therefore, at best, the KKLT in the first step will give rise to a would-be Planckian supersymmetric one, which is not geometrically under control, as would be needed for effective field theory that KKLT need. And, and at any rate, for the case of the oriented fold of Calabria, this is bounded by 252. Even if you don't worry about the species scale and so on, this gives you uh, lambda bigger than 10 to the minus 2, which is far too small that for, for what they do. There are examples in the literature that try to do this kind of example with much smaller lambda, but, uh, but the, 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 this shows that there's going to be an issue. In fact, in those examples, if you look at the flux classes that are arising there, you can show there is no supersymmetric cycle in those classes. So you can literally show explicitly that there's no special Lagrangian submanifold in the classes that were suggested to give you such a small value. So, here we have used conventional, this is what I want to emphasize. We have used conventional notion of holography. Some devil's advocate might say, why did you assume that? Who told you to do this? That's all the examples we know in string theory. Of course, somebody might say, well, maybe there's something else. For example, somebody to, could have told Andy and I when we were doing our black hole calculation, we have these fluxes of black holes. 
We yeah. dualize the two brains and we got the right entropy. Somebody might have said you're lucky because there might be some other object with the same fluxes and you haven't included. Okay, they could have said it, but the evidence is, is in favor of, of, of what I just said. Namely, fluxes are replaced by brains. Here we do have the requisite brain with the cor correspondingly correct supersymmetry. Everything is ready to go. And if somebody says there's another brain, it's on them to find the description. So given this, let me conclude. Scale separation does not seem possible to achieve in ADS context, at least in known ways that people have proposed. Assuming conventional holography, KKLT scenario is obstructed even in the first step, let alone the second one. And this suggests we should be looking at other ways to get potentially quasi the center. Thank you. I'm not familiar with, with which bounds that Thomas Hill discussed. He was talking about the analog of the, he said that if they know the diameter is bounded, then the eigenvalue is bounded. That's, we, we use that, but he doesn't get any of these bounds we're talking about. No, he doesn't talk about. I, I just talked about, I just talked about what I can. This is barely, as you can see, I struggled even here. So it's not easy to, to get general statements for general cases. I cannot, I cannot know what, what that may or may not mean. But the usual method to argue that these are under control and there are such solutions is not easy, let alone other ways. I don't know. This is the yeah. brain, the brains do not necessarily have conformal symmetry at the beginning, right? They flow to a conformal theory. Yeah. Conformal theory, uh, it's Coulomb branch. I'm not sure why you bring Coulomb branch. There's no Coulomb branch in my discussion. No, no, but I'm just saying that, let me say it better. Take ND3 brain. ND3 brain does not have a conformal symmetry in string theory. They only flow. Even if, even if not, not, I don't have to go to Coulomb branch to see it. Put them on top of each other. It doesn't have conformal symmetry because there's a string theory coupling to it. In the infrared limit, it gives you. This is similar to that. The, definitely, that, that feature is definitely different because, in the, because we have such a small co-dimension. That's indeed the problem with holography when you, don't have, when you have only co-dimension one. That's exactly the problem. It's not going to work unless you make one dimension big. So there, you're exactly pointing out the correct issue with potentially realization of the holography of KKLT. In other words, it is the solution of such types to try to get such solution with scale separation will exactly have all of these issues you're mentioning. The most natural scenario we believe will happen was that the Calabria will decompactify. That's the issue. In fact, in the first step of KKLT, if you do not include the superpotential corrections, you see the volume goes to infinity. That's the, so that, and it, it is a supersymmetric solution. But that's what I think is always going to happen. Why are, we, why are we smearing the three brain? We don't need to. We, we, we are interested in the conformal theory, which is when you put all of them at the same point, and that's the limit I talked about. Lots of theories that apply to the same thing. 
That, that example is not quite the way you are saying it. There's a Klebanov sightland version, which is conformal. Then you're talking about cascading down, which is, which is not conformal at the beginning, and it flows down at the infrared to non-conformal at the end also, to a massive QCD, no, no, no. for example. It, 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 can it can go to flow whatever it does, but I'm talking about the end stage. The point is that you have extra degrees of freedom because of the degrees, which indeed fly away. Yeah, but then that, that's even worse because it makes less degrees of freedom. So, so let's go one by one. Let's go. Yeah, yeah. But Mike, you're going too many steps. Just one step at a time. You can make it, but you can. I cannot respond to it. <laughs> Maybe he wants to lecture. I don't know. Okay, so, so I, think, I think we can talk one by one. First of all, the Cytlin and Klebanov example, which is ADS, is the one we are relevant one for us, not the one which is not ADS. We're talking about ADS version, let's be clear. You can talk about, or if you, want the, if you have the bottom of the Klebanov Strasser's throat, which is ADS, applies. In these cases, everything I said applies to what they say. There's no difference. They have this, the issue of the scale separation and all that, no problem. Everything matches. You don't get scale separation there. There's nothing exotic there. And I'm perfectly fine with that example. I'm not criticizing that at all. It's perfectly good. That was one example that you were mentioning. What was the other one you were mentioning? My point was that there are many field theories, as was in the case of Klebanov-Strasser. No, the Klebanov-Strasser example that you're... No, excuse me. No, no, no. I'm talking about one ADS at a time. No, no, no. Mike, can I answer? I'm explaining to you. You're talking about the cascading flow along the flow. It's not ADS in the middle. It's only at the end. I am talking about ADS. I'm talking about ADS example because KKLT believes there's ADS, right? I'm only talking about that theory at the end. If I start with it and, and your cascading doesn't help you, in fact, it hurts you. Why is that? I'm starting, you would dec low, lose degrees of freedom, not increase it. You are going to be something which is dual to it, which is object that gives you that holographic dual, which has the same flux, and you're going to lose degrees of freedom by going to infrared. So the UV. There are, many, there, are many, there are many theories with the same that correspond to the same flux, but they have many more brains. Because if I can get, a, if I, there has been no example where you have the same brain which gives you the same flux with two different dual conformal field theories. The example you told me is not that. There is no. I am talking about the flux that survives, Michael, at the end. The flux that they survives at the end is dual to the holographic dual D brain. In, in fact, you can start with the, in, in the context of a Klebanov Strassler, you can start at the bottom of it and talk about their brains, and they are dual to the brains they're talking about. So therefore, your objection is not at all relevant for a discussion. I think, I think this, this exoticness applies when one is desperate to get a solution. I appreciate, but it's not. Uh, <laughs> well, the, the burden of the proof for whoever is saying it is constructing one. Thank you. <laughs> we'll, we'll wait for it, Mike. <laughs> Thank you.